never look down on your loss. Look at it as a, as, as a point of uh, growing. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me here on episode 218 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Today, we're going to hear from a great guy, Sifu Rick Wong. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, but here on Martial Arts Radio, we're bringing you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice every week. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all the returning fans, and welcome to any of you new listeners out there. We appreciate your time. Shin guards. Sort of the unsung hero of most people's sparring gear sets. People tend to think about gloves and boots and helmets, you know, even mouth guards. Until they clash shins, that is. You know what's great about the whistle kick version of shin guards? They don't move around. If you're tired of readjusting your shin guards, head on over to whistlekick.com and check out what we offer. Lots of colors, and they can go on over or under your training and competition uniforms. Affinity for martial arts may actually come from heritage or just the way you were raised. And that's certainly true for Sifu Rick Wong, who fell in love with the martial arts as soon as he saw kung fu movies. Sifu Wong is trained with some of the pillars of the Chinese martial arts world, including Sifu Bao Sim Mark. At the same time, he's made a name for himself, but he's here on the show today to tell us some stories, and they're good ones, so you best stick around. Better yet, help me welcome him. Sifu Wong, welcome to Hello. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to this. You know, we've, we've passed some emails back and forth, but this is our first time talking. So, j- listeners, in the in the same way that that this is your first time with Sifu, this is my first time with Sifu. So we're we're all in this together. <laughs> we start in in a very similar way each time, and and I like that. It gives us some some framework to move forward. It gives us some consistency across all of these episodes that we do. How did you get started? as a martial artist? Well, I'm of uh, Chinese descent, and uh, I was raised in New York City. So as, um, you know, uh, the typical Chinese uh, skinny teenager, I spent a lot of time uh, in Chinatown, New York City, watching the myriad of kung fu movies from Golden Harvest and Shaw Brothers and so forth. So, you know, back in the 70s, there were five movie theaters, which you could easily catch a double feature pretty much every other day. So uh, having grown up watching uh, Chinese martial arts movies, uh, you know, and having an affinity, an, affili- affiliation, an affinity for that, I uh, started training in um, 1979. And my first uh, Kung Fu Chinese martial arts teacher was a man named uh, Sifu Peter Chima. And uh, Sifu Peter Chima is often known as the uh, adopted godson of the uh, Shui Zhao Grandmaster Chang Dongsheng. His specialty was Shui Zhao. And uh, the primary things I learned from uh, Sifu Peter Chima were uh, northern traditional long fist and uh, Shui Zhao Chinese style grappling and wrestling. And um, that's where I first started my martial arts practice. Okay, so here you are, you're, you're watching kung fu movies, and you, you said, I, I've got to do this. And, and you find your instructor and, and you jump in. Was it what you expected? Um. It was what I expected. I knew it was going to be uh, hard work. One of the things that I thought was very special about Sifu Chima was the fact that he didn't run a commercial school. It was a sideline to his real professional side job. So because he didn't teach full-time commercially, he only had a small number of students. And he didn't take children or young teenagers, but he took me as a student. So the interesting thing about that was I was always the youngest member of that school for many, many, many years. And when you say young teenager, you know what? Uh, yeah, 13, 14, 15. Okay. The majority of the students there were fully grown, adult, mature, 20, 30-something-year-old guys. They were very fast, very powerful, and I was always the one that had to stay up and catch up with them. So that was the major, major challenge. And how did you face that as as someone who's younger? I mean, someone in their early teens isn't always mature enough to handle that big of a gap between themselves and others. That, that was actually the fun part, the challenge of uh, realizing that at a certain point, um, I probably had to learn skill and technique better because I knew patiently that at some point I would physically mature and that might, you know, I would grow, I would get a bit more muscular, I'd get a little faster, I'd get a bit stronger. 
So um, I, I did, uh, as they do in Kung Fu movies, and you think about the Kung Fu and the uh, skill and practice, I figured, let me just pay a special emphasis on uh, technique. The physical aspect will catch up with me, and um, I think that was uh, the key to my ultimate success and my progression in terms of practicing and teaching martial arts since 1979. Mm. What was it that hooked you? I mean, you know, when we talk to people on the show, you know, I mean, the the challenge and, and there's a lot there's a lot there that I think we all share about our love of of training. But what I find can be a little bit different is what grabs someone early on. You know, anyone that's run a martial arts school knows that when someone comes in, you don't have six months before they decide, yeah, this is something I want to do. They're going to make that decision in the first few classes. That's true. What was it for you that you said, ah, this is where I want to be? All those kung fu movies were right. This is my place. Probably the thing that made me know I wanted to go that was uh, being Chinese and knowing what martial arts should look like. I think the thing that I that really made me appreciate that school was it was and it felt authentic. Because those were the years, uh, you know, where you would buy your comic books and for 99 cents you could be the uh, Iron Palm Master and you could get uh, ripped with Joe Weider in six weeks if you paid $1.50. So uh, the school and the instructor and the lineage was honestly legitimate and traditional. And um, that was the thing that I realized I wanted to do. There were too many, and there still are if you're in the martial arts field. An awful lot of hokey, charlatanish, overrated people. So I knew that was the place to go. Was there? Not sure how to quite sure how to ask that. As someone of Chinese descent, was the fact that kung fu came from China? Was there some? Was there a bond there for you? Was there something more than, say, I as a, you know, a, a, a white American learning karate? You know, I, I don't have that that tie to Japan in the way mm-hmm. that you do to China. Was that was that at all part of the equation? Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, definitely. Um, there is that that cultural component of a feeling like you need to do that. Um, uh, when I, I went to Boston University for physical therapy and. When I went to college, I wanted and I needed or I relished more sparring partners. So when I was in college, I did I did the Shotokan Karate Club at Boston University. I did the Boston University Taekwondo Club. But I was really amazed how when the primarily Korean population of the Taekwondo Club found out I was Chinese, I was kind of ostracized. So the same way as I can understand that you – affiliate with something of your culture i can also realize that on occasion sometimes if you're not of the same culture you can't really jive or um you know unify it Mm. interesting so there's something to be said for training in a way that came from where you came from i mean right there there might be some nuance there uh, you know, let, let's forget for a moment the, the exclusion right. aspect, but there mm-hmm. may be some some benefits to being a Korean training in Taekwondo or? I, I believe so. Okay. I believe so. Although by the same uh, token, I think that the most honest and legitimate people, not necessarily martial artists, but people in any uh, walk of life tend to be the most open-minded. So um, I, I know a lot of martial arts instructors and professionals of all types of careers who really it doesn't matter to them who they teach, what they teach, or who they associate with. But unfortunately, sometimes the the most closed-minded people are the most closed-minded, regardless of what their vocation happens to be. Mm. I like that. It's rather poignant. Here on the show, we tell a lot of stories and Oh, you know, we've, of course. It's we, podcast. That's right. It's sto- stories are the best. I mean, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I say this periodically on the show. The whole reason that I started this show and in this format was because I wanted an excuse to get people to tell me their martial arts stories. <laughs> because those, honestly, those are the most fun 
for me, whenever it's a, it's a seminar or a, or a, you know, a weekend camp or whatever, I just find myself bringing back the stories, uh, as much, if not more than the, the physical training. True. I'd love to hear one of your stories. You know, if you have a favorite or a best, might you share that with us? Uh, sure. You know, it, it's interesting because, uh, best is hard to say because best is so um relative uh, i like yeah. to say that some of my more interesting stories are the ones where i learned something so you know from a martial arts perspective i frankly think that the best things to encourage growth and progress is to actually lose something um i remember when i was first training we went to a uh, open karate tournament in new york city and, and those were the days when it was, you know, there, nobody used macho or century or, or even whistle kick back then. It was just barefoot, bare hands. And to get a point, you needed to violently shake or disturb the body of the opponent hmm. in a bare knuckle, bare foot type of method. But I, I remember this tournament. It's not my best story, but it's the one that made me think about, wow, I really have to train. My Kung Fu teacher said, we're going to go to this tournament. And for reasons unknown to me, he put me in a division that I probably was going to be outclassed. I think I was been training about a year and a half. Um, I only knew three forms, and we also did sparring. Um, I remember that the first competitor I competed against, I won. I was very happy. It's the first time I've done this. The second competitor, I had already seen him uh, destroy somebody else, and I saw him warming up against me. And I thought to myself, I'm a goner. But I figured, let me let me try my best. Nevertheless, even though it was open karate points barring, I was drilled with a kick that just completely flattened me. And I thought to myself, my God, this is embarrassing. I can't get up. It took me a while to get up. I, I lost the match anyway. But I thought to myself, okay, uh, this is never going to happen to me again. I learned something. We went to the forms divisions. We were tied. It's, uh, I think it's, it's the green belt division because it's you know a year and a half of training, give or take. I remember that I did a form and it was a three-way tie for first. They said, you got to do a second form. I realized I couldn't remember any other form except for the one I competed with. So I uh, messed that form up too. So I lost the match, got flattened, forgot my form, was thoroughly humiliated. And I said to myself, okay, this is never going to happen to me again. So it's not my best martial arts story, but it's my first martial arts story. And my first martial arts story is be prepared, have confidence, don't overestimate your opponent, have a set of techniques that will work for you, always have three to four bare hand forms, if available to you at a certain skill level, and go from there. So um, losing is the best way to progressing. That's not a, my best story, but it's actually a good story. I think that's a great it never story. happened to me again. And what did you change in your training so it didn't happen again? Uh, we looked to see, uh, you know, uh, why did I get dropped with this kick? My classmates told me. My teacher told me. I was actually fortunate enough to have to face this opponent the next year at the very same tournament. And although I did not win, I gave him a serious run for his money. And... Uh, I also got first place next year in the bare hand and weapons category. Since then, I have no longer compete, but for a while I did open karate tournaments pretty successfully. When the Chinese martial arts competitions started to uh, become popular, I started competing in those too. And uh, as, as I always tell, we're not going on the parting advice for martial, art, martial artist training, but um, without a doubt, um, never look down on your loss. Look at it as a, as, as a point of uh, growing. I'm not necessarily a biggest football fan, but uh, if you saw Super Bowl 51, the Patriots being down 28 to three was probably one of the best examples of don't give up. Because mm. at halftime in the last Super Bowl, most people thought the Falcons are killing the Patriots. The Patriots just hung in there, and they ended up winning the Super Bowl. So uh, I always tell people uh, look to your classmates. Look to your teachers. If they're honest, sincere, and legitimate, they'll guide you in the correct direction. Mm. I love how you tied that back to that game because that game will always be very vivid in my head. I was watching it with friends, and I had to come home eventually, and I thought, you know what? 
it's halftime. You know, I watched a little bit of the show that I wanted and I drove home and I got home and I said, let, let me check the score. And I turned it on and went, oh, now we have a game. Right. And on reflection, the thing that I think you, you can say about the Patriots in that circumstance, the, maybe the, the heart of part of what you're trying to get to, at least. It's that you said, don't give up. But there was a confidence. There was a patience. I, I think a lot of people, a lot of teams in that situation would change their strategy dramatically. They would start throwing thing, things against the wall to see what stuck. Mm -hmm. But the Patriots recognized how good they have been over the last however long. I'm not a huge football fan either, but they've got a bit of a dynasty going and they trusted their training. Exactly. It, it boils down to, uh, you use the word trust and, and trust is a, is, is a key component. Um, as a, Sifu, Rick Wong, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an instructor or I've been certified by two instructors. One is a Sifu Peter Chima, and my other teacher is a Sifu Boston Mark. So I'm very fortunate to, you know, have lineage in two different styles and two different, uh, you know, uh, martial arts families. But when you use the word trust, I did have a third instructor who always said I can't call him his instructor because I already have an instructor. And he was not a Chinese martial arts practitioner. He was a Kyokushin Karate Sensei in New York. And, you know, if you're familiar with Japanese Kyokushin, the Kyokushin uh, term is searching for the truth. So that's about honesty with yourself. So trust. Kyokushin Kai, the association to search for the truth. I think trust is something that maybe we don't talk about a lot in the martial arts, but it's so deeply rooted in everything we do. We have to trust our training partners. We have to trust our instructors. As instructors, we have to trust the students. Absolutely. Without that trust, the whole framework, you know, it just, it collapses and you end up with chaos at best, at worst, lots of injuries and no one coming back. Absolutely. Yes, it's true. Outside of martial arts, are there things that hold your interest? Any any hobbies, passions? Well, at this point, my oldest son is a uh, college senior at UMass Lowell, and I have twins that are boy and girl twins who will be going to the high school. So uh, my hobbies or pursuits other than martial arts has been uh, enjoying uh, my kids' accomplishments. Um. Do, do they Noteworthy, train? I just coached my son's soccer team, and they were the uh, boys under 14 Middlesex uh, League champions, and um, very proud of my son. Um, I did use a combination of martial arts and soccer training in terms of getting faster leg speed. Um, it was not uncommon to see my son's soccer team or our soccer team performing uh, modern wushu basics as the warm-up. So um, that was a lot of fun. It gave kids a uh, serious leg speed and serious leg control. Um, can, can I? Yes. Yeah, I, I want to ask a little bit about that because that's something that I bet you're, I'm sure you're not the only one listening right now. Well, you're, you're speaking, but I'm sure we have others involved listening right now saying, yeah, I, I coach soccer, basketball, football, and I've always wanted or maybe even tried to bring some elements of martial arts into our warm-ups, into our practices, but I wasn't able to do them or I didn't do them effectively. Clearly, you not only did them, but did them effectively. How were you able to get the kids to adopt that? Well, you know, it's a funny thing because the reason why I coached this team is because my son, Chris, said there were some slight disciplinary problems and they were afraid of me. I'm a pretty easygoing guy, but apparently, uh, according to my son, uh, some of those kids were going to listen to me to do whatever... Uh, you know, I asked them to. And the other thing, too, is it's lead by example. Um, I'm going to be 51. Most people would think that I'm, I don't know, 10, 15 years younger. So I didn't tell them to do the warm-up kicks. I demonstrated and led the warm-up kicks. And, you know, once you lead a slight competitive element in something, they have to keep, keep up. So uh, uh, the other thing, too, is... Not that I want to talk about the movie Shaolin Soccer, but, uh, you know, in the movie Shaolin Soccer, you had those guys, 
you know, doing uh, Shaolin and modern wushu, and it's a popular movie. But yeah, as as uh, whether it's soccer or basketball, you know, there are a lot of traits that are similar to uh, martial arts. There has to be coordination. There has to be speed. There has to be intent. There has to be structural alignment. There has to be fluidity, and there has to be a certain sense of open mindedness and, and being fluid to the situation. So it, it's really no, no, no different. Uh, I often tell uh, you know young teenagers that I work with them, uh, especially. Not necessarily for martial arts practice, but for like off-season training. Um, some of the best things to do for off-season training tend to be, in my opinion, because I'm also a physical therapist at Spalding Rehab in Malden, an outpatient clinic. The best things are clinically uh, stated are martial arts, yoga, tai chi, and dance. You know, if you look at somebody who's an Alvin Ailey, those are superior athletes. You know, if you look at somebody who's a highly skilled yoga practitioner, that is a superior athlete. So uh, it's easy to sell this. Let me take it back. It's not easy to sell it to some teenagers or it's not easy to sell it to some athletes. But uh, nobody can deny that a good dancer or a good martial arts guy isn't fit. Right. So when you sell it like that, it works for them, especially when you can demonstrate that you're better in better shape than they are for their age of 14 or 15. There's some great advice in there, and I, I hope, listeners, that if you are able to to make some inclusion of martial arts into the other things you do when when teaching people, that you'll you'll throw some feedback and you know tell tell us how how have you been able to do that and you know the the lead by example I think is a critical piece. It's I, I see a lot of martial arts instructors that teach from standing or no, exactly or even sitting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that only works if the people in the room have been, you know, if, if they had seen you do what you do. Absolutely. Or, or, right. Right. Okay. I'd like you to tell us now about a time in your life when things weren't going so well and how you were able to use or reflect on your martial arts training to get through it. Mm. Can you re reiterate that? Absolutely. So we all go through tough stuff, you know, whether that's, right. um, you know, something physically difficult, uh, you know, we, we have had guests talk about illnesses or maybe a, a challenging family situation, you know, something with, with children or a spouse or parents, uh, up to, we've even had guests talk about physical confrontations mm -hmm. where they've been attacked in, in some dramatic way. Right. Well, Going back to the concept of uh, patience and trust and having faith in oneself, probably the most challenging uh, period of my time uh, was about three years ago when my family and I were on vacation in Vermont, and uh, it was school vacation in February, and you know in February everybody goes skiing because it's school vacation. I I'm not the greatest skier in the world, but I remember I was going down a slope. There were a lot of little kids all around me, and I thought, wow, I'm going to have to do some serious maneuvering here just so I don't collide. Just as I was planning my route, and it was pretty icy out, uh, some guy just shot past me. Uh, I went flying. I tumbled down and tumbled down and tumbled down, and uh, I could definitely feel that I was injured. So I got myself up, fell down a few more times. Uh, I had serious pain in my arm and I couldn't move it. I thought, okay, maybe I dislocated it. So uh, as it turns out, what ended up happening after all my diagnostic work, I uh, had a spinal cord compression injury. So it left my right arm essentially half paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, fortunately, as a physical therapist who does martial arts, I thought to myself, okay, uh, Another diagnosis, another prognosis, this is going to take a long time, I'm going to have to be careful. Um, for example, I couldn't do a single push-up for six months. That's frustrating. I can't do a push-up. Um, at this point in time, three years later, I can handle any weapon, I can spar, I can wrestle, I can grapple, I can do pretty much whatever I need to or want to do. But 
the thing that happened with that was it made me, here's that word patience again, it made me be far more patient with anybody that I taught, but it made me be far more patient with anybody that I treated clinically because now I knew what it felt like to take twice as long to get dressed. I knew how frustrating it was to take a little bit longer to get the car started and so forth. So um, whenever I work with students, they say, oh, I'd like to be able to learn faster, or why am I moving so slow? Or when I have a patient who says I tore my rotator cuff and this out, the prognosis is slower than I expected, or I had my ACL reconstructed, or I had a stroke, you know, I, I can honestly give legitimate advice based on experience, not just on academic uh, textbook theory. And I'm sure all of your students and your patients are much happier with that additional sure. perspective yeah. you have now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We've heard about a couple of your instructors and you and I talked a little bit before. So, you know, I've, I've got a sense as to how important they were to you. So I, I kind of want to take them out of the mix for this next question. Mm hmm. If I was to ask you who the most influential person on your martial arts upbringing has been, who would that be? Influential. Uh, influential. It's so funny because every period in life has that single influence, and it's hard to – very, very difficult to uh, answer that. If, if you're unable to narrow it down to one, you can talk mm -hmm. about more than one. I would probably say that the three people that are most influential are uh, Sifu P. Chima because he, he got me started. Right. And uh, I always appreciated that. I would say that the second person is Sensei Ed Frazier, who uh, trained me in a uh, Masoyama style. He is the person who most people in my martial arts interactions don't know too much about. He wasn't formally my teacher, but he was a high school. He wasn't my martial arts teacher, but he was a high school teacher in my high school. And what he had done was he had been um, unhappy with the politics that occur in pretty much most martial arts organizations. So he had kind of pseudo retired and did not want to be involved in martial arts. And one day, on a Friday afternoon, he saw myself and a bunch of my friends. We had like a little informal martial arts club in high school where every Friday after school, we just went down to the cafeteria, moved some chairs and tables around, and I uh, had a couple of friends who did Taekwondo, a couple of friends that did uh, Fu Jiao, a couple of friends that did Seven Star Praying Mantis, a couple of friends that did Hapido. What we would do was we would take turns leading warm-ups, kind of like working on the techniques that we had been working on. We sparred round-robin against each other. We had a fabulous time, and we shared what we had. And I knew that this uh, teacher at the high school, Ed Frazier, was a well-known martial arts teacher who stayed away from him. He was almost like, like a Jedi Knight in retirement who just didn't want to be involved, but... Mm. He kept coming down just to walk by and observe for curiosity's sake. And one time he just came over, started giving advice and started to help us out, gave really good advice. And, um, you know, I'd like to say that he's one of the people that taught me to be very open minded, meaning his issue with martial arts was don't teach this, do teach that. You get a fourth degree if you do this. You don't get a fourth degree if you don't do that. But he... When I graduated from high school and went to college, one of the things he had said to me was uh, that my friends and I brought back to him a love of martial arts the way it was done, purely for improvements and for sharing. So he's a special person. Uh, the third person who was very, very, very special to me is uh, Grandmaster Bosa Mark, because that's the next teacher that I had once I moved from New York to Boston. And I first met her at Boston University when... All college students have to take a phys ed class. So I signed up for her Taiji class, which was Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 8 in the morning. And no college undergrad wants to take a class at 8 in the morning. But one of the reasons why I went to Boston University is because 
she was well, well, well known. So that's why I went to Boston University. So um, she's my third very, very major influence. Uh, uh, one of the things I loved about Sifa Mark was she's a woman. And I've had this conversation with her daughter many times about what's it like to train with or take class from a woman. And, and for me, I think it was humbling in a different sort of way. My first training was involved with very fit, powerful, athletic people, whereas now all, she's extremely skilled, highly skilled, and extremely physically talented, but the skill for martial purposes used by a five-foot woman versus a 5'8 guy who's jacked is completely different. So uh, having gone from two male instructors to a female instructor, I get a sense of sophistication in terms of forms and combative skills, which really uh, tempered and gave the yin aspect to the yang aspect that I always, always used. So uh, because of the fact that her son and daughter are similar to my sister and I, meaning roughly the same age, it, it, it felt very familial. Mm. For example, uh, my oldest son is the same age as her oldest grandson. That kind of thing. So uh, because there. her oldest grandson, you know, lives far away. Uh, when I had my when my first son was born, anytime I took him to class, she always held him and walked with him and talked to him and so forth. So for her or for me, the symbiotic relationship was she. I learned tons from her, but for her, in her case, it felt like she had. You know, family. You know, a grandson, meaning my own son. Right. When you look back, I'm sure on those three individuals and the other folks that you've trained with, you know, it becomes kind of this layered sort of mesh approach. And I wonder if you had done things in a different order if you had trained, say, with Sifu Mark first, do you think you would have ended up as the same person? No. As a matter of fact, um, I love the way it turned out. I think it turned out uh, beautifully in terms of, you know, as, as a martial arts practitioner, I, I think it worked out fabulous. Uh, I learned uh, excellent combative skills, and then I had those combative skills, and I wasn't a very good forms person, so I ended up getting the, the core rough skills, and then I had it polished down as I, as I needed to, to have it done. So I think it worked out best that way. Mm -hmm. uh, one of uh, Sifu Mark's uh, lineage is uh, Fu Style Bagua, and uh, historically, Bagua practitioners who are of any uh, skill are skilled in something else, and then they learn Bagua. And the training of Bagua supplements and improves the pre-existing skill. So uh, I, I think it worked out fabulous. I don't think I would have been able to go from like Taiji, Bagua, modern Wushu, and then make an attempt to learn combative skills. I think it worked great the way it turned out. And, and I have absolutely no uh, regrets. I think it was optimal. Now let's kind of flip that question. We talked about the people you had trained with. Let's talk about who you haven't. If you could pick out one person from any time in history, anywhere, alive or dead, who would you want to train with? You know, I've thought about that question because, um, you know, Fu style Bagua is Sifu Mark's uh, heritage or lineage. And I also teach that, of course, as part of the family uh, uh, tradition. That being said, the person I would like to meet is uh, Fu Style founder uh, Fu Jensong. And the reason why that's my curiosity is because Fu Jensong took classical Bagua, layered it with his Chen style Taiji that he had learned initially, uh, was a contemporary of uh, Yang Chen Fu, and of course did Yang style Taiji, uh, learned Wu Dan Sword. And also trained with uh, Sun Style founder Sun Lutang in uh, Taiji Xing in Bagua. So the, my curiosity is, and I would love to have, you know go back in time and ask or train Fu Jensong, um, 
what made you add elements of one style versus delete certain elements of other styles? Because in, in the world of martial arts, and, and I know most listeners will agree with this, you learn techniques, you learn techniques, you learn a form, you learn a form, and at a certain point, you have more stuff than is useful or necessary. You only have this, this mess and this clutter. So um, similar to uh, Bruce Lee's concept, at a certain point, you have to get rid of stuff that's unnecessary. So uh, I would ask Bu Jin Song, what elements, or, or why did he s choose certain elements from his training to keep, and what elements did he discard? The other thing that's interesting to me about Bu Jin Song is he grew up in that period of civil unrest, you know, um, Sino-Japanese War, uh, Communist Revolution. So if I were to be able to go back in time, I would like to see what it would be like to work with, train with, uh, the people who went through the Boxer Rebellion, the Opium War, Sino-Japanese occupation, that kind of thing, because those were the years where uh, defense, reputation, and killing somebody had to be done. You know, right now we just like go for points or joint locks or submissions, but uh, when people really realize there was their livelihood and their life, uh, that's when it ha has much more meaning. Hmm. You mentioned a little bit about movies, you know, certainly the impact yes. they had on getting you into the martial arts mm -hmm. and you named some of them mm -hmm. but i'm wondering do you have favorites do i have favorites favorite martial arts movies is like best martial arts story it depends on your mood i i, I have to admit uh as a young boy i did not enjoy the bruce lee movies of you know like 72 or 73 because i thought they were too realistic which is funny because that's why people like them mm. however uh, when I get to favorite martial arts movies, uh, I would definitely say that one, which is the answer for many people, is probably Enter the Dragon. And, and the reason why I like Enter the Dragon is because uh, Warner Brothers, you have a Chinese protagonist, you have Jim Kelly, African American, you're willing to put him in a supporting role, you know, John Saxon is a supporting role, and uh, it has great martial arts it has great philosophy and i really appreciate that um so from a serious martial arts movie i really love that one uh, from a comedy martial arts movie uh, the first comedy martial arts movie i saw was jackie chan drunken master and i'm sure a lot of people love that one and the reason why i love that particular movie is um it really showed the athleticism of how one can be i remember when i was a young teenager uh I learned my kip up from watching Jackie Chan movies, hmm. and I, I emulated his kip up technique. So, Drunken Master for uh, athleticism, and uh, Enter the Dragon for the integration, uh, the realism, the grittiness, and um, the philosophy. Now, how about actors? You mentioned Jackie Chan. You mentioned Bruce Lee. If you had to put a couple of actors into your favorite slots, so to speak, would they be there or, or would it fall to someone else? Oh, oh absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, I think that one of the best martial arts actors is uh, Samo Hung. And one of the reasons why I love Samo Hung is because his longevity. His longevity has been amazing. You know, when people watch Enter the Dragon who don't know much about martial arts history, they always say, yeah, Bruce Lee beat up that fat guy at the beginning. Bruce Lee didn't beat up the fat guy. Bruce Lee put Samo Hung in there as a tribute because he respected Samo. So, you know, Samo was a choreographer in the 60s. He did his uh, action movies on his own. He's paired up and uh, co-starred with uh, Jackie Chan and uh, Yuen Biao. And, you know, even 10 years ago, he did uh, uh, SPL with Donnie Yen. And Donnie Yen was at the peak of his physical powers, and Samo still looked fabulous. So, in my opinion, one of my favorite martial arts actors is uh, Samo, because uh, one would never expect that a very chubby person, one, can move like that, and move like that since the 60s, and he's still making movies in the 2000s and teens. Yeah. yeah he's, he's utterly incredible. I remember the TV show, I think it was called Martial Law. Yes. When I was a kid, and it was one of the few things my mother and I could agree on, mm -hmm. and we would watch that, and I just remember how unassuming he looked 
until there was a fight sequence. Exactly. And then how dominant he looked. No, it's true. And the funny thing about Martial Law, which was a great show, is if you remember, it was back to back to Walker, Texas Ranger, which I was not particularly fond of. Um, you know, talking about the integration thing, I, I respect integration. I'm Chinese, and like Bruce Lee, I'm married to a Caucasian woman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my uh, brother-in-law, my sister's husband, is African American. So uh, I'm I love integration. I love working with everybody. But once they put in Arsenio Hall in with uh, Simon, I thought this movie's gonna go, this show's gonna go downhill now. <laughs> yes. And and it disappeared soon after that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was um, he was not the right person. Arsenio. Yeah, he was yeah. not the right person for that role. Wesley Snipes maybe. Uh, right. Yes. But but not Arsenio. How about books? Are you a fan of martial arts books at all? Yeah, I uh, have a pretty uh, big collection of martial arts books, without a doubt. You know, they span the gamut from books where a form is being taught to books where applications are being taught, you know, to books about philosophy like uh, Tao of Jeet Kune Do. So I, I have a ton of books. I, I, I love books. I think uh, reading is wonderful. Are you going to ask me what one of my favorite books is? <laughs> well. I'd love to know your favorites, but I'd also, because if you have an extensive collection, mm -hmm. you know, we, we tend to get a lot of the same answers for this question. And, and right. I think that's good because it underscores how important some books are. And, you know, I'm sure there are listeners out there that it takes the 30th time of them hearing, you really need to read The Art of War before they're going to go read The Art of War. Yes. But if, as someone who has an extensive collection, maybe you, you have a title or two that you'd recommend that people likely haven't heard of. Well, I have to admit, one of my favorite books that's not about martial arts, but is one of my favorite books, is uh, the Marie Kondo book on clearing out. Are you familiar with that book? It's been on the bestseller. I'm not. No. Yeah. Tell us about it. It's by Marie Kondo. There's a lot of self-help books on trying to get, you know, like uh, less stress and cleaning out your basement and cleaning out your closet and so forth. And it... it it's by Marie Kondo. I can't remember the exact article, but well, the reason why I like about that is because it's not just about cleaning out your basement and cleaning out your closet. It's about clearing out your consciousness and clearing out the, the stuff that's in your mind and how your mind gets uh, matched to stuff you own or you possess or think that you need. So uh, the reason why I like that book is because we're all a little cluttered at heart, physically or emotionally. And uh, you know, earlier I made a comment about how at a certain point, you don't need 75, you know, or 100 joint lock techniques or uh, – I don't practice Kempo, but I know there's like pinyon this and pinyon that and 35 ways to go against a right reverse punch. And at a certain point, you have to get rid of stuff. So um, this book that I've had for the, since it first came out really teaches you how to psychologically appreciate and understand that you don't need things to be happy. Whether it's a, a form, a martial arts technique, a belt, an accreditation, or junk. Hmm. For sure. Sounds like a great book. We'll put that in the show notes along with everything else we're talking about. For anyone that might be new, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Now, how about like your, your favorite martial arts book? Probably... One of the most instrumental martial arts books, or the probably the two most instrumental martial arts books, are the first one I ever bought, which was, um, I haven't looked at it in years, but I think it's uh, James Liu and Harry Wong, Kung Fu Kicking and Stretching Methods. And the reason why that one, I don't want to say it's my favorite, but it was instrumental. And the reason why is because when I first wanted to take Kung Fu classes, my father said, I don't want you to do this if you're going to quit in six months. So don't even waste your time or effort or money if you're just not going to stick with it. So my father said, why don't you do this? Go down to the bookstore and buy a book about Kung Fu or whatever. So I bought this book, uh, Kung Fu Kicking and Stretching Methods. And my father said, look at the chapters and pick like a bunch of exercises. If you're willing to do those exercises, you know, like four or five times a week 
for the next three months, then we'll sign you up. So I bought the book. I followed along. I stretched here. I kicked like that. And uh, I felt like that was my uh, my starting blocks. So when I took my first class, at least I had been stretching for a good period of time before I did that. Um, that's a very basic book. It was by Unique Publications. It came out in the 70s. Uh, much later on, probably the next favorite book that I had was the book by um, uh, Sifu Bose and Mark, the one that's called uh, Basic Wushu Training. Because when that book came out, I already was pretty positive I was going to move to Boston to go to college. And I was already pretty positive I was going to go to her school. So when I bought that book, you know, there's the uh, young Christine Yen, there's the uh, young Donnie Yen posing for this, and uh, mom's doing the stretches. I did the same thing. I went chapter by chapter, I did all the exercises, I did all the exercises, and I gained even better flexibility and leg skills just by uh, spending time with that. So those two books, I haven't looked at in years, but if you look through my book collection, you can easily tell they're weathered, like they've really been handled. Mm. Was your did your purchase of that book and, and and what you read in it solidify or at least make you even more sure that Boston and and Sifu Mark School were where you needed to go? Oh, definitely, uh, because uh, in addition to her Taiji and her Bagua skill, uh, she's very very well known for straight sword skills. And uh, the ability to use a straight sword is usually not very good in most kung fu schools. You know, most kung fu schools have pretty you know, pretty good staff and broadsword skills. But uh, I always knew that I wanted to improve upon what I had, and I also wanted to be much better at straight swords. So, in addition to that book, I already knew that I wanted to go to her school for the for the training of straight sword. You know, if you look on my Facebook or my uh, website, you'll notice that my logo is a silhouette of myself with a straight sword, which is the exact same uh, concept as her logo, which is herself silhouette with a straight sword. So yeah, I, I already knew I was going to go to her school. Hmm. Cool. Let's talk about the future. Your, your teaching, your training. I'm sure there's a reason. You're, you know, it, it's not your, your profession, so you're doing it for reasons other than financial. Why? What What's keeping you moving forward? Well, you know, as uh, as I get older, you know, you, you worry about your health. I've already gone, you know, through my uh, neck related uh, spinal cord injury. So, um, as I go into as I'm in my third decade of teaching, um, you know, my my primary goal is to maintain my health and fitness. Uh, knowing what I know about. Western physical therapy, orthopedics, sports rehab, injury prevention, and leg legitimate Chinese martial arts. Uh, w one of my goals is to pass that on. I know that um, you know uh, Christine Yan and Jean Lucas and myself have been working to uh, promote the uh, Bosa Mark Taiji Arts Association in terms of propagating for the future. And I know one thing: there has to be some kind of combination of the best of evidence-based practice, not just allegorical stuff. So uh, one, one of my goals is really to just get the best skills available, kind of discard the stuff that may actually be not so good or potentially a, a waste of effort, time, and motivation, and then just push that on to you know, the next generation. Um, the other thing, that's, that's the big picture. The, uh, the smaller picture... Or well, the individual picture is, you know, for myself. Uh, there was an article in the Boston Globe uh, about two months ago about the number one thing that ails men in their 50s and 60s. And according to the Boston Globe article on the number one ailment for men in their 50s and 60s is loneliness. It's not prostate cancer. It's not cardiac disease. So one of the things I'm really, really fortunate is uh, – not just my physical therapy job, but when I practice and teach Chinese martial arts, there are students, there are, uh, you go to tournaments, you go to competitions, you go to performances, you go to workshops, you do all these things and somehow your uh, social structure becomes bigger than it used to be. Or, for example, let's just say that I practice uh, Shui Jiao, 
you know, I have Schweigel classmates, friends that I know from competition and classes on the West Coast, in Europe, in Asia. Uh, I practice that Taiji and Fu style. You know, I have friends, colleagues in Asia and so forth. So uh, it's the bigger community picture. The world is getting smaller, so they say, because of uh, technology. But even though the world is getting smaller, people seem to be less happy, potentially. So uh, one of my martial arts related goals is, um, as the Chinese people say in Mandarin, Wulin Yi Jia, the martial forest is one family. So everybody technically does this for purposes of health, but socialization is a huge one. Cool. And now tell us about how we can find you. You mentioned a Facebook page, you mentioned a website. If people are interested in you, if they want to get a hold of you, maybe they're, you know, traveling to or in the Boston area and they'd like to look you up, you know, how, how would they do that? Well, my uh, Facebook, I'm sorry, my uh, website is uh, Rick Wong's Chinese Martial Arts Center. From You know, that's also on uh, Facebook, so a person can easily look that up. Okay. And they can contact you from there. And, of course, we'll, you know, as oh, with absolutely. everything else, we'll, we'll have those links. So if you're mm -hmm. driving in the car, you know, please don't try and find something to scrawl on while you're driving. <laughs> you know, we want everyone to be safe. Yeah, please drive safely. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate your time here today. And I'm wondering if you might leave us with some parting words. Uh, my parting words are just be a good person. Uh, take care of yourself. Uh, take care of your family. If you happen to be a person who teaches martial arts, uh, take care of your students. If everybody just does a little bit of uh, taking care, the world has to be a better place. I found Sifu Wong to be thoughtful, kind, and honestly, the type of person I'd love to train with. Boston isn't that far away from me, so who knows, maybe that will happen down the road. Thank you, Sifu Wong, for coming on the show today. Over at WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find all the show notes from today's episode, some great photos, links, and names of the books we talked about. Find WhistleKick on social media, at WhistleKick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. The next time you see someone adjusting their shin guards, do everyone a favor and let them know about ours. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for doing that. You know, that's it for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.